yes, a little bit uh, sort of soft, but I can. Okay, great. We've just moved the microphones a bit closer, so hopefully that will help. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Welcome. Um, we're going to spend a bit of time today talking through this year's Deloitte's Media Consumer Survey. Um, I, uh, obviously, I know some of the team around the table. You've been here before, but for those of the uninitiated, this is the 11th edition globally um, of this report. And it's the sixth time that we've run it here in Australia. So um, we've got some good um, uh, uh, longitudinal data um, and the sector continues to evolve over that period. So um, it's always an interesting read. This year we've seen restructures, efficiency measures, TV advertising headwinds, and media reform is, is firmly back on the table. Um, so against that backdrop, we think it's really useful to think about consumers and how Australians between the end ages of 14 through to 70 are interacting with and responding to different forms of media and entertainment. It's a rich survey, there's many angles in it, um, mo many of which TMT sort of related, so media and telecom related, but not exclusively so. And some of the topics we're going to cover off with you this morning are TV, just not as we know it, our changing relationship with social, how consumers are responding to advertising and the impact of fake news. But before we do that, I'll just give you a little bit more information on the survey itself. So we survey over 2,000 um, Australian people online across five different demographic groups. We run the survey concurrently in different international markets, and this year we fielded it in the US, China, Japan, and Norway as well. Um, the timing of publication of those reports differs, so we've included some relevant data from the US market where we can and where it's relevant to do so. The survey covers um, sorry, five different age groups we've talked about there. So millennials, leading and uh, trading and leading, Xers, boomers and matures. And the stats we've put there just give you a feel for the proportionate size of the Australian population across those age groups. We explore usage patterns across five different categories. So video, social, news, advertising and gaming. And um, as I said, it's a rich survey. There's lots in the report, but we're just going to take you through a few of those findings this morning. So Kimberly, do you want to to kick us off with yeah, the first no one. <clears throat> so our first theme is looking at TV just not as we know it. In this year's report, we're really studying the rise, not the demise of TV. Watching TV content is in fact as popular as it's ever been. We're just not doing it in the same way. Video content is really synonymous with entertainment, and as Australians, we really can't get enough of it. The average viewing hours have increased, we're streaming more, we're binging more, and while we're watching it in a very different way, watching TV on any device has become our number one entertainment activity. The story starts with Generation V, which is a generation that encompasses all age groups. Across all generations, we're spending 17 and a half hours watching TV type content each week. That's up from 17.2 hours uh, in 2016. This is predominantly driven by boomers and matures who've added 1.3 and 1.7 hours respectively to their weekly schedules. At the same time, our binge watching habits are really becoming entrenched. So the majority of respondents, 59%, um, are binging, and that means they're watching three or more consecutive episodes in a single sitting. Nearly a third of bingers do it weekly, and in fact, this year, we've moved from five episodes in a binge session to six episodes, so that's nearly 4.5 hours of television watching in a single sitting. But where did I get the time? <laughs> I wish I had the time. It's a lot of TV, right? And I, I guess what we've seen is our smart TV and sort of TV plus setups, as we're calling them, uh, are those things that are enabling us to watch more, stream more, and binge more content than ever before. And sleep less. And sleep less. <laughs> and watch it in bed at night. Um, 50%, so half of respondents this year have indicated they now own a smart TV in their household, so one that's IP enabled. And at the same time, we're supplementing our TV setups with over-the-top streaming devices or boxes like um, you know, Apple TV or, or Telstra TV and um, uh, portal streaming devices like Chromecast. So 26% of people have an OTT box of some description and one in six, so 17%, have uh, used a streaming device. So given how much time we're spending um, what doing it, it's no wonder that watching TV uh, on any device is still our number one entertainment activity and that's on par with browsing the internet. So that's both of which are rated by 59% of survey respondents as being in their top three. 
the time spent watching um, streamed or catch-up television has increased this year. Um, it's increased to 24% of to respondents' total viewing time, up from 22% last year uh, and 18% the year before. It's grown so quickly, actually, just within the three years that streaming services have been in the market, um, that level of subscriptions has caught up with pay TV subscriptions. 32% of, of survey respondents now have an SVOD subscription, which is up from 22% last year, and that surpassed pay TV subscription in our reported data at 31%. And pay TV has been at about a third of the market for, um, for, for, for many years. We think there's room for more growth. 25% um, of those that don't currently pay for an SVOD service are still accessing them through a free trial, so they're still maybe in an experimental phase. Um, and if you look to more mature markets, so the US, for example, where streaming services have been um, you know, ubiquitous for a while, um, they're now at 40, 49% of households um, have an SVOD subscription of some form. Did you ask how many were sharing their friends' I, subscription? We did. Day? There's, I, I'll check that for you. There's in the ones that are accessing it but not paying for it. There's a degree who are sharing, and then yeah. there's a degree who are still in in trial phase. Mm. I think it's in the main report, sure. um, and it's one's not enough either, by the way. So, mm. Um, mm. thirty-two percent of SPOD subscribers um, are subscribing to multiple services, and that's quite a jump. It's up from eighteen percent last year. So we're getting more comfortable with the notion of many different subscriptions for different type of contents. Uh, and from our point of view, that's a brilliant thing for, for consumers, right? So instead of SVOD wars being about kind of a zero sum game and, you know, winner takes all, it's actually the consumers who we think are going to be the victors, <laughs> you know, just the quality and the range of content that's, that's available. So staying on the topic of TV, um, despite the rise of streaming and its popularity, live programming, so that's content provided at the time of broadcast, still remains the most common method for watching TV content at the moment. It accounts for 44% of total viewing time. And catch-up services account for a further 10% of viewing time. So if you consider those two things together, the traditional broadcast players still dominate our, our overall TV experiences. And that's particularly the case for older viewers. However, one slight pause for cause, I suppose, is that this year we've seen a bit of a change in the viewing of those genres which are most um, critical to broadcast audi audiences, so news and, and sport. Across all genres, news and sport are t still the ones that are most often watched live, you know, live in the broadcast schedule, but it has declined markedly over the last two years. So if you look at um, news, less than half of the respondents this year, 45%, indicate they most often watch news live. Um, compared to 63% in 2015. And in fact, we're as likely to watch movies live as we are news, and obviously <coughs> movies don't have much live appeal, if you will. Um, when it comes to sport, a third of respondents, so 20, well, less than a third, 29%, most often watch sport live at the time of broadcast, and that compares to 38% two years ago. And Building on that, there was another question which talked to the proportion of respondents who consider TV as their preferred device for watching television, and that's fallen from 55 to 45% this year. And we think there's a few reasons for that. I mean, ultimately, it does come down to the alternatives available. So, you know, the ability to uh, live stream games of NRL or AFL on the apps that those codes, uh, you know, own or have created, live streaming of uh, cricket, what WBB on, on um, uh, WBBL on the Cricket Australia website, and obviously the role that telcos now have in providing sports content, um, Telstra streaming, AFL matches, Optus, EPL, and so on. So there's partly a choice thing, but also partly a behavioral thing on just how people are comfortable using different types of devices for, for sports content. Thanks, Vicky. So our next theme um, is really looking at our changing relationship with social media. So last year we highlighted the rise and dominance of, of social media networks really as entertainment destinations in and of themselves. And this year we recognize that social media has you know, really cemented its place in our lives, but the question is, you know, has it truly won over our hearts? Um, we are seeing consistent with last <coughs> year that a fifth of our online respondents, um, uh, sorry, a fifth of our online entertainment time is spent on social media. And we're still seeing high daily usage with 59% of respondents engaging with social media on a daily basis. That's slightly down from last year, which was at 62%, but it's, an, uh, sorry, 61%, and it's back on par with our 2015 levels. 
So while the influence of social media is undeniable, the reality is in the survey this year, respondents are starting to show some signs of dissatisfaction. So 20% of respondents disagree that they enjoy the time that they spend on social media. And nearly half, or 46%, say they, say they spend more time on social media than they would like. Many social media users have even gone as far as to take a break, with 31% of respondents having permanently or temporarily disconnected their social media account this year. And even more interesting is that deactivating behavior, um, we're seeing that most commonly at 46% by our social media pioneers, the leading millennial age group. Leading millennials are showing further signs of unliking as we could see their usage, their daily usage this year has dropped from 84% last year to 73% in 2017. So finally, an interesting data point, 29% of total respondents and a whopping 43% of millennials said they spend more time maintaining their social image than they actually spend on in-person relationships. But alarming, really, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And I mean, the question is, is social becoming antisocial? Yeah. <laughs> and what can the platforms start doing to bring more utility um, to the platforms for users? And that, that, that doesn't include more filters. <laughs> <laughs> as fun as they are. Yeah, as fun as they are. Um, so staying on the social theme, but a slightly different angle, Another indication of our change in relationship with social is that we're taking our conversations out of the social media spotlight. 63% of respondents say they would prefer to have conversations with their contacts and friends on a messaging service mm. rather than on a social media network. Conversations on messaging service are known as dark social, which means it's the online sharing of content or conversations in a private channel that's restricted to a group of users and not publicly accessible on social networks. So this is going to present both a challenge and an opportunity for brands because as conversations go dark, brands are losing the full picture of the customer discussion and mm -hmm. customer sentiment. But at the same time, there's an opportunity for brands if they can capitalize on it, which is to create an exclusive environment mm -hmm. and really become part of an intimate and trusted circle with, with their uh, customers and consumers. And a really good example of this was Adidas with something that they launched called Tango Squads where they invited a small group of fans to get early access to content and product launch exclusively through a messaging service. And then the expectation was those fans would take that information out of the dark and into the light mm. as influencers on the broader social media platforms, and then it went viral from there. So mm. it, was a, it was a good outcome for Adidas. Yeah. Do, do we know which messaging service it was? I suppose it doesn't matter. But I think it was WhatsApp. WhatsApp I think it's one. Yeah. 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 Um, so moving on to our next topic. Yes, so I'm, I'm going to just touch on consumers' response to advertising. So after word of mouth and its digital equivalent, which is online recommendations from people in our trusted circle, TV advertising continues to have the greatest impact on purchasing decisions, with 53% of respondents saying that it had a high, to high or medium influence. When you look at the year-on-year -year trends, no doubt TV um, has fallen. Um, since the beginning of the survey in 2013, it's fallen 10% and it's had a small drop from last year, which was 55%. At the same time, the fastest growing influence on respondents is social media advertising, which is up to 36% this year, which is about a 14% overall CAGR since 2013. Hi. Um, the, this brings the influence of social media platforms about on par with our traditional media, such as newspapers, magazine ads, and radio. And not too surprising, amongst millennials, um, uh, social media advertising is now almost on par with TV advertising as far as influence. Other winners this year are endorsements from online personalities and celebrities, and tweets and posts from a company that's not already followed. So while there's these seemingly more personal or intimate ways of connecting with consumers, along with social media ads and text messaging and mobile app ads, they have increased their influence, but it's been off of quite a small base. Um, there's still no better way to connect at scale with audiences than TV. And um, TV advertising should definitely not be written off just yet because it remains critical to discovery, to building awareness, and to long-term brand association. The biggest challenge that advertisers really have to worry about is the fact that, if possible, consumers would like to avoid advertising altogether. <laughs> Most respondents, 77%, so say they would skip an ad playing before a video. 
50% will abandon a short video altogether if they don't have the opportunity to skip the, the pre-roll ad. And approximately <coughs> one in three, or 31%, now just use an ad blocking technology to avoid ads altogether. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, the final topic we just thought we'd um, talk about this morning is, um, is about news. Um, so it's a bit of an introduction. This year in the data, we're seeing something of a, a kind of new balancing act, I suppose, as, as consumers con are comfortable consuming digital and uh, traditional ways of, of sort of accessing and, and, and consuming news. Like they're balancing those together. So 37% of um, respondents now most frequently use digital sources as their primary source of news. That's down slightly from last year, which was 40%. And on the flip side, 55% of respondents most use traditionally, you know, most use traditional sources, so, you know, print, radio, and magazines, um, and that's compared to 55% last year. So we've kind of seen that the growth of digital forms has sort of plateaued, and the decline of the tr traditional, sorry, growth of digital has plateaued, decline in traditional has kind of plateaued as well. So while that almost feels like sort of no news, it's almost that there's this this news norm, if you will, where we're comfortable, you know, interspersing our, our Twitter feed with our checking of an online article, with our browsing of the papers the weekend, and that just being how consumers are comfortable bringing those different um, consumption modes to, in, into their experiences. Overwhelmingly, we, went, we remain unwilling to pay for news. Um, only 9% of us are willing to do so. Oh, sorry, we, we remain unwilling to pay for news online make the difference um, with only nine nine percent of us are prepared to do that and when we do it's primarily because um, we value two things and the first is in-depth news analysis and the investigative piece that's the you know the full backstory and importantly when we trust in the brand which brings us on to fake news well there's also there's a nine percent gap there is that people who just don't look at news at all um, yeah, probably. I'll double check the data point for you, but yeah, there'll be those that, um, yes, I'll double check that for you. Um, so, just to close off on fake news, I will check that for you. Um, Australia was not exempt from the phenomena of, of fake news last year. 65% um, of survey respondents who access news through online sources are concerned about being exposed to fake news, and 77% believe that they already have been exposed to fake news of some form. The difference here, I think, about those that are concerned versus those that have been exposed is, is almost, you know, reveals that we don't necessarily think we need help to discern the truth, or we can discern the truth. Um, and when we ask the question, 80% of respondents who use online news sources believe they are capable of working out what's fake and what's, what's real. 66% state that they take the time to actually assess the validity of the material by considering the source and the author. And um, irrespective of all of that, we have taken action. 58% of respondents have changed the way they access news material online given the prevalence of fake news. And we feel that's played out a little bit in one of our other stats from this year where we've seen those survey respondents who use social as their primary source of news has declined this year from 18% to 14%. This is just a small, small mm -hmm. movement. We think that's one of the contributing factors. So, a bit of a whistle-stop tour. There's a lot there. Um, to sum it up, um, the four that we've covered this morning, rise, of t rise not demise of TV, you know, TV just not as we know it, um, our changing relationship of social, we perhaps haven't unliked it totally yet or broken up with social, but there might be some signs of, of dissatisfaction. Um, how consumers are responding to advertising and the impacts of fake news, but overall as Australians, we believe that we can discern the truth. So thank you, happy to carry on the conversation, take any questions. Well, I've, I've got a question about um, a form of media that has advertising and, and has content and people tune in and tune out and there might be fake news there and, and also you know people pay for it with their attention and I guess some people even pay for it and that's radio and podcasts. Mm. I know with radio yeah. I was listening to a, a, a broadcaster talking about how he didn't realise that yeah. you know people weren't listening all the time, they were tune in and tune out and yet yeah. with his podcasts people very regularly listen to the whole thing you know, yeah. and because they can stop and pause or they can just listen to it and it's, yeah. so they've got two different mediums there, you've got advertising there, you've got news. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, have you done any studies on that and, and where does it all fit in? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I, I mean, I, I think there's been a real resurgence in podcasts. I mean, personally, just as a consumer, I love them. I mm -hmm. listen to them all the time. And I think, again, the way that technology has enabled us to move our 
um, listening experiences from you know in ear to in car with Bluetooth, and that the story or the or what you're listening to can to move with you. Um, we don't ask a specific set of questions around radio or podcasts. One of the things that we do look at is radio as an influence on advertising. Uh, sorry, radio advertising as an influence on our purchase decisions and it's really interesting it's remained absolutely stable mm -hmm. in the six years since we've been doing the report so it started at 37 in 2013 it's at 37 now and it might have gone one or two percentage up or down so I think there is a definitely a cohort of people who um, for whom the radio is a companion that is on the way to work mm -hmm. it's on the way to school it's, it's it's sort of an immersive experience so I agree it would be an interesting one for us to dig into next year yeah, yeah. The ninety percent who won't, or ninety one percent who won't pay for online news. Yes. Is there? Have you seen a? Do you have a measurement of the decline or increase in that number? Probably, but just not in the in the data this year. I can dig that out for you because we ask the same question every year. I okay. think it. I think it has remained pretty stable. I think maybe a couple of years ago it might have been fourteen percent who are willing to pay for news, but it, it's it's. It started low and it's kind of not really increased. Mm. Yeah. You, you might not wish to give people ideas, but I mean, one question that would be worth asking at that point is: Do people actively figure out ways to get, get around, paid news yeah, for get free? Around the yeah, like go into um, yeah. private mode to get around paywalls. And yeah. I mean, some yeah. uh, publications are very strict. You can go to private mode all you want. They they know that, and they'll still say, "Look, you've got to pay." Yeah. Other yeah. sites are much more. Um, True. lenient about it and, and I still come across people who are surprised that you can do that I, mean, oh, I yeah. didn't know I could do that I mean, <laughs> and yeah. it's not just paywalls it's all it's not just going to private mode but also searching for articles on Google uh, you get the headline yeah. you put it in and oh you know they think you're a Google search when you really you're just trying to jump the table yeah uh, I completely agree that we do ask one question about the extent to which um, consumers are willing to pay to avoid ads and that's across all forms yeah. um, and in most instances um, their willingness, their stated willingness to pay to avoid ads has increased this year by a couple of percent. But I think there's always a little bit of a disconnect between mm. people's stated intent mm. versus actually what they will part with cash to do. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's an interesting angle there about you know actually getting around rather than just mm. avoiding. Mm. Yeah. And certainly also from our perspective, which is completely self-interested, but but you know on that whole thing of fake news, it'd be yeah. interesting to see. Okay, so people say they can determine what yeah. is fake yeah. and what is real, and, but what are those, like, what are the qualities what are they that, yes. for that, to that determine what is, what is quality news or what is... I know, and it's know. an interesting one, isn't it, because I was thinking about this when we, yeah. were, we were writing the report, and there's a, such a spectrum yeah. from, you know, sensationalist or kind of grabby headlines, Tabloid. potentially, yeah. at one end Clickbait. of the spectrum, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all, yeah precisely, yeah. all the way through to sort of deliberate misinformation, yeah. Yeah. and in the middle you've got kind of satire, yeah. and as Aussies we'd probably be quite happy with some, some humour in the middle, you know, yeah. and, and I think, you know, we can discern that sort of spectrum, but I think for consumers it's also worth thinking about what are the steps that I can take yeah. to proactively, you know, look at the byline, what's the source, you know, beyond the headline, what's the, what's the, yeah, what's right. the next line yeah. down? Is, is, yeah. it, is it a trusted news source? Is it, it a trusted exactly. journalist? But, but is I mean, it a, that's yeah. exactly what I mean. But also, yeah. on, on top of that, it's, it's looking at a number of different sources of the same story. Like, in, in the old days, that. Yeah, people would yeah. watch SBS, ABC, Channel 7, S, you know, CNN, Fox. Yeah. Nowadays, I mean, I go to Google News or some other news source and I'll open up half a dozen articles and quickly read them all to mm. see. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the th questions, just on this whole thing, this... Is it possible for you, and maybe it's too much trouble or too difficult or people won't do it, but you know, could you get a bunch of stories, ones that you knew were false, ones that you knew were real, and, and, and ones that were sort of in the middle, and say, look, tell us which one you think is real or not, that would be so a you can judge them. wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, just, just to see if people are, yeah. you know, really are we, as we, perceptive we as they think. We could work with you on that, because that we're, be we're essentially the custodians of, yeah. of, of you know, excellence in journalism. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah definitely. Um, you know, and we, I mean, this is one of the things I was actually talking to Tony about, oh, okay. around around this report and so forth, so I'd be happy to carry on that conversation yeah, that sounds interesting. outside this meeting. Mm. But there was a related point I was I was reading, or well, as we were preparing for this, this conversation, um, that the 20 top fake news stories in the US election mm received more engagement on Facebook than the top 20 stories from the major 19 news outlets. Which were behind a paywall. <laughs> right. Which, yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so I think, it is, look, it's, I think it's a really interesting topic. Mm. I think it's something that as co consumers resonate mm. with, but the, the industry, you mm. know, it's important for the industry, mm. it's important for our mm. society to have kind of accurate mm. <laughs> journalism. Yeah, um, so yeah, I think it'd be a great conversation yeah, to continue. Great. It'd be fantastic. Do you break down um, news in terms of channel, in terms of what channels um, 
consumers actually trust more than others. So, so print versus TV source versus online, online. versus social. Ah, do we cut that in the data? I don't think we. The story isn't about trust. It's the story is about willingness to pay, and so then it's when you do, when you are willing to pay, what are the reasons for that? So they, we don't break it down by more willing to pay for print versus versus TV or you know versus other another form. It's what are the drivers for your willingness to pay? So it's that investigative backstory, you know, the detailed story, and the the trust in the brand. Mm. I find it quite peculiar I, that the lack of trust has increased due to fake news. Yet people aren't willing to pay for it. It's almost like they don't value news. So the lack of trust, sorry, the lack of trust hasn't increased per se. What we're saying is, it's it's trust well, in the, the brand. The concern over fake news is, is is quite high. C concern is high, indeed. Yeah. And I think primarily um, the questions regarding the ability to identify fake news is more on the online context. Yeah, that's true. As a, as a channel. Yeah. So. But, but how, how big was fake news you know, last year? It's only in the last year that people You know what, really we didn't even ask the question last yeah, year. So okay. every year we update mm. kind of what we include in the mm. survey to try and make sure that it's topical and, and kind mm. of following the sector. It changes so quickly, I mean, we can't keep up, frankly. Fake news has been around <laughs> forever, but it's, you know, it's only, it's only, it's only sort of really... Come to the spotlight. It's, it's you know, a yeah, thing. That's right. yeah. Thank you, Brie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. There are positives. <laughs> when you looked at advertising... Uh, Chris, I might uh, jump in with Sorry. a question, or another question on fake news. I mean, do you think there is an inflection point coming to see if people want to keep avoiding ads, but you know, only 10% of people are willing to pay, but 65% of people are concerned about fake news? I mean, at some point, there's got to be a tipping point, because you know, these are people's jobs, that sort of content needs to be paid for somehow, and if they're not going to pay directly or they're not going to pay through ads, at some point it's, it's either going to collapse or um, they'll have to pay them some way. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that um, I think that there will always be a group of people who are willing to pay for quality journalism from sources they trust and with this backdrop of feeling exposed, feeling concerned that there are consumers who would you know make the leap through the paywall and, and, and subscribe to, to paid news sources. I, I, I agree, Max. I also think there's behaviours more broadly, and we've talked about this before, about um, as, as people, we're really comfortable with the pay-as-you-go model now, you know, on, telco, on phones, on, on S-Pod yeah. subscriptions, on many and many other walks of life, and I think sort of micro-payments around certain art articles, if people just get more comfortable with that as a behaviour, around their, their media consumption. So I, I, I agree, Max. I'm looking to the ceiling because your voice is coming from, the, coming from the gods. But part of the problem is there is still no proper micropayments platform that's yeah. taken off. I mean, if yeah. there was, maybe that would make it more you know, easier for people to justify Yeah, pain. undoubtedly, yeah. yeah. I guess the problem is there as well, sometimes some of the most popular articles are, you know, the sensationalist type of stuff, maybe some of the celebrity type of stuff, but some of the important things, like politics or other areas aren't necessarily the most well read, but they're important uh, in terms of, you know, holding the people to account. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and I think there's this mixture of kind of fast news and slow slow news. So there's the, the fast stuff that you want to get. It might be obviously breaking news, but it also might be just more kind of consumery led news or easy to consume kind of news versus slow news. You know, the news that you actually want to dig into, sit down, turn the pages, get immersed or follow a story as it evolves over a, a, a period of time. Um, and I think newsrooms have to be able to do both really well, right? They've got to be able to satisfy our need for kind of, you know, here and now, but also um, uh, meet our, our, our quest for that sort of, uh, sorry, our thirst for that investigative angle um, by, by supplying that slow news, if you will. Mm. Any, any other final questions? Um, you mentioned that people said that they were more willing to pay for news when it offered them sort of in-depth in -depth reporting, yeah. analysis, yeah. Um, that were sort of trusted sources. Yeah. Are you seeing a correlation between you know, them saying that they're willing to pay for that and then actually paying for that, is there? No, so sadly, their stated intent <laughs> well, is, always well. higher, yeah. is always higher, it's always higher. Probably the same for, for um, you know, paying for content, paying for music, paying for things. Mm. That's yeah. exactly right. I mean, with the s at least it's a subscription. You pay one amount mm. per week and you don't, mm. a month and you don't think mm. about it. Yeah. yeah, and I think the other yeah. angle there is the ability to just stop the subscriptions. I think that is one of the... Um, 
the, the lack of ongoing commitment means that people are comfortable kind of oh I'm going to sign up till I get through these eight episodes of this back catalogue of the West Wing or she says I'm speaking friend. personally yeah. Um, yeah. you know but then I don't need yeah. to watch that for a while because I'm going to divert my attention yeah. to Game of Thrones which is on Foxtel mm. and I'm, you know so I think it's mm. and I think that's a fantastic choice right then mm. you can put your yes. dollars and your time whether and it's even becoming more fragmented right in some cases you can you can just go with a channel or a show that's and, right and so I mean, if you look at video as sort of setting the trend, I mean, just back to the micro payments, right, and being able to just get the content that you want and being willing to pay for the content that you want. I mean, we're seeing that trend, obviously. Mm. Music was first to go, yeah, and course. video, yeah. and, you know, news yeah. could be next. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, guys. Uh, sorry, you mentioned uh, this fact. Oh, sorry. No, no, I'm looking at the sky again. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, dissatisfaction and that's with social media and there's been a um, downtrend in use. Is, is there anything sort of around privacy concerns? Uh, consumers have a better idea about what, um, you know, what Facebook and other social media platforms are taking in terms of their personal information? Yes, there are a couple of data points on privacy. I'm just scanning through the 40 pages to find it for you, Max. Um, I think there's something like 70% of um, respondents are still concerned about um, their use of. Can you give me two seconds, and I will find it for you. Um, sure. I will point you to the right page. You know when you've read something and written so something. Yeah, I've got another one on yeah. um, the fall of uh, live sport and broadcast television as well. Yeah. I'm wondering uh, if you ask anything about, so I guess, the, the rise of over the top from overseas sports. Um, obviously, Optus has CPL and. Then I, I completely so I'll answer yeah. that one first. I completely agree. Those are definitely drivers. Um, you know, certainly the getting up at three o'clock in the morning to, to watch um, an EPL game is, is sort of different if you're doing it on a on a mobile phone device or you know, there's definitely some offshore um, offshoring, if you will, of people who will go and watch um, content sports content on other platforms that we don't traditionally associate with sports like Facebook or, or Twitter even in the US so I, I agree I also think it's this um, this notion of uh, choice and being able to um, you know, have different ways so like subscribe to the app and, and go and see the shows that you want to see as opposed to being beholden to I've got to watch it at four o'clock because that's when it's on um, but yeah I, I would certainly contribute that to this to the slight move away from from live max and I'm just trying to find your privacy, your privacy one. Um, can I email you afterwards just to point you to the right page? Yeah. And whilst you're doing that, it may be too granular, but some of these people watching overseas content may be using VPNs to do so because it's not otherwise available here. Mm. And um, maybe that's a question worth asking too. Yeah. Next time about VPN usage. Yeah. Thing is, you can't use them in China anymore, in Russia. We can still use them here, thankfully. We, Malcolm Turnbull hasn't banned them yet. Mm -hmm. When you looked at people watching video content and how that's increased a little bit, did you sort of go more granularly and look at across which devices, whether it's going a little bit more or less on TV or more or less on smartphones? Did you sort of go at that, that level of detail? Um, there isn't a device angle, but there's a form angle, if you will. So we look at um, live viewing, catch up, downloaded on DVR, mm -hmm. um, pay-per-view so there's a sort of a, the mode of watching as opposed to the device okay. of watching and that split is in in the report for what sure page is that? <sighs> testing my memory uh, it's on page it's 11 on, yeah. page 11 very good well thanks everyone thanks. thank you for joining thank us this much. morning really, yeah, really you. appreciate you making the time um, happy to answer any questions, happy to delve into any of the, the reams of data that sits, sits behind this and, and really appreciate your interest. So thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks.